afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our April webinar, um, our Engaging Student Voices series. Um, a little bit of introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Ashley Stora-Smith. I am the Student Voice Manager at the University of Nottingham Students' Union. I'm also the Unity webinar host. Uh, the reason why I do this is to, um, and the reason why I'm hosting is so that we have someone who's working on the ground in the sector and uh, able to um, understand kind of what particularly the needs of um, people who are actively working in this sector um, need from these kind of activities. Uh, as you can see behind me, I'm not in my usual location. I'm all the way in Blackpool uh, today. Um, this is because um, I'm actually helping out at NUS National Conference. So uh, probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest gathering of students in, in the country. Um, so it's really nice to be around um, uh, this kind of student voice and student engagement for the past few days. Um, and it's great to be hosting it from here with you. So we're going to go on to our breakout. Uh, our, we're going to go into our structure for our webinar. So it's very similar. If you came to our webinar month, last month, it's very similar. So we have our presentation portion, portion by our um, uh, by our excellent guest today. Uh, we then go into a breakout session and then a second breakout session. We'll be splitting the uh the group in half uh this is so that everyone gets the opportunity to speak to uh our presenter and also myself um and then we'll do a plenary at the end to kind of wrap up um and then talk about what's happening next uh, i'm now going to quickly pass over to irene to discuss some uh new things that are happening in unity Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Irene. I'm the University Engagement Officer at Unitu. And um, yeah, I, I just as we wait for more people to join us, I'd like to take a moment to introduce what we do at Unitu to those who are new to our webinars. So at Unitu, our main goal and idea is to help you easily engage with the student voice. And to do that, we organize these monthly webinars. But we, as you already, uh, many of you, you know, we build digital tools. And recently, we've introduced a tool designed to empower student leaders and ensure representative feedback from students. And it is the feedback campaign tool, as you see in the screen. And the main idea is to streamline and automate the student voice meetings. So in our research, uh, after many interviews that we did with staff members across different universities, what we found is that there are significant challenges uh, in the process of gathering feedback from students and conducting those student voice meetings. So generally speaking, what we found is that student reps uh, find themselves ill-equipped to provide representative feedback uh, during those meetings. And this often results in unclear outcomes and follow-up actions, which leads to not being able to close the feedback loop effectively. So to solve this, we've implemented this solution uh, that allows to collect feedback uh, well in advance in, uh, to those student, uh, terminating student voice meetings. So the idea is that reps, uh, student reps can summarize the feedback, can gather the feedback, they can summarize the feedback, and then they can categorize the feedback into different uh, themes with the help of AI. And uh, this, again, empowers them to, to have more productive discussions during, during those meetings. And in terms of um, reducing the administrative burden uh, on the staff members, we've also streamlined the process post-meeting and by eliminating uh, the need for complex spreadsheets, for example. Instead, all real-time action logs provide like a centralized platform for recording meeting minutes and follow-up actions. So the idea is to close the feedback loop effectively and effortlessly. So yeah, the tool is available for, for trial at no cost. So if you're interested to learn more about our tools or signing up for a free trial, I'll be dropping a, a form link in the chat and I'll be in touch with you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Aaron, for that. Um, that's a, a really great opportunity uh, for people within this webinar. We're now gonna move on to our um, our, our guest speaker, Callum, um, talking about empowerment versus consumer, uh, an issue officer's voice perspective, uh, a voice perspective of, of authentic student voice. Uh, thank you very much, Callum, for coming um, and uh, being our, our guest today. Uh, I'm going to now start sharing slides, um, so you can start. 
Thanks, Ashley. Just hoping that everyone can hear me properly. So I um, hope you can hear through the mic uh, and Ashley sharing my slides. Um, I've got a very small screen in front of me. I've learned that I probably need two screens for things like this and my lighting's not particularly good. So it's not it's not great webinar etiquette on, on my side. I thought I'd have learned by now after the pandemic. But um, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Uh, my name is Callum. Um, I was uh, the former undergraduate education officer at UEA Students' Union uh, from 2019 to 2021, so spanning uh, just pre and then just coming out of post uh, pandemic. Um, and then during my time in office, I was also uh, Aurora student president. So uh, a group of European universities uh, supporting on wider higher educational uh, issues for students. So I supported um, an, an international campaign for student voice and engagement uh, with Aurora for two years uh, and then I've been involved uh, over a number of years with uh, the Office for Students and the Quality Assurance Agency in various roles around sort of student strategic priorities, uh, student uh, submissions for TEF in the recent um, TEF submissions um, and so I've had my sort of eye on several different aspects of student engagement across the UK. Um, I'm currently working uh, on, on a PhD at the University of East Anglia around uh, higher education, teaching and learning practices and how that contributes to student sense of belonging. Um, uh, I'm a school governor in two local secondary schools and I currently work in EFI as well, teaching uh, students with special educational needs. So even though I've moved away from student unions, uh, I still have student voice, student engagement and student experience at the, at the heart of, um, of what I'm interested about doing. So before we move on uh, to the next um, to the next slide in a moment, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm hoping to do uh, in the short time that we're together this afternoon. Um, so as I said, from 2019 to 2021, I was the uh, undergraduate education officer um, at UEA Students Union, and I think I saw firsthand the benefits, the challenges, and the hurdles to what we would class as maybe good student engagement for learning. And it became clear that there were challenges affecting our ability to connect with student demographics, which affected how confident I felt as an officer at the time to represent um, and to uh, present ideas and views and perspectives to other students. So from far reaching the, the, hard, the hard to reach to discussing co-creation educational policy, changing a culture of tokenistic representation and exploring the relationship between honesty and student engagement. I continued and still do continue to sort of ask those questions about what engagement looks like and how students' voices garnered for positive educational change in higher education. And how can we move away from having a, a seat at the table to more meaningful voice and engagement in teaching and learning issues that affect students? So in this presentation, what I'm hoping to do is draw on some of my own reflections from my time in office to offer some observations, some conclusions, some reflections on what questions we might need to be asking to tackle student engagement. And I'll also explore times where engagement felt good and at times where it felt completely wrong for me as an officer when I was in office. And I'll draw on a couple of kind of key theoretical frameworks for student voice and participation. And then I'll invite yourselves as colleagues, really, when we go into breakout rooms to provide your own reflections on what engagement has felt right and wrong through our Padlet that we've got and work together to really identify kind of any key actions to take away for planning activities to reach wider student demographics. And this is gonna be supported by some of that key reflective questioning we'll have in the plenary. I was due to give this sort of talk at another, another conference. I was really pleased when Unitu uh, invited me to come and deliver this because uh, I was unwell and unable to deliver it at the time. So it's nice to be able to, to bring some of these ideas and conversations uh, together. So if we move on to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the contextual framing for this. So. In my opinion, I think student unions have received some quite a lot of criticism in the last year spanning the pandemic for being sometimes unrepresentative, for sometimes lacking in democratic legitimacy. And there was some work that was done by Wonky um, in 2020, so slightly dated now, but looking at, you know, are student unions a waste of money? And I think if you talk to sabbatical officers about their time working as a representative uh, in student voice, some, if not all of them, at some point in their office will have experienced individuals or departments with this mindset. And so the challenges that this can bring or, or make a representative's life more extremely difficult are questions that might come out of how many students did you ask? How big was your mandate? Or, well, your students didn't really seem satisfied in the NSS, so why should we support this idea or these ideas? And the list could go on. And these challenges I found when I was sitting at the table in teaching and learning committees uh, and trying to present I view, uh, views and new ideas or initiatives for ways to engage students 
and to support them in their teaching and learning. These are the types of questions that sometimes I'd, I'd be asked. And that's not to say that there wasn't fantastic examples of participation and student voice in my own institution and other institutions, but there may well be this rhetoric that's present and, and many colleagues may have some of those similar experiences and frustrations today. And it raises the, the tensions between universities and the student body when making these changes for student experience. And so my experience as a sabbatical officer was true of some of these possibilities. I've sat in meetings where my concerns on teaching and learning have been questioned because there wasn't enough data on how other students felt about these issues. But I've also been involved in really meaningful and important work for the university or other higher education organisations where the voice of students really feels like it is having an impact and making a difference for the future of students. So if you move on to the next slide and think about some of the theoretical framing for this. Now, this slide is, is not particularly clear on the pyramid, so apologies for that, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it so you get a flavour for it. I think deeply ingrained into this reasoning of participation and engagement is that the bedrock of student engagement. And recently, this has been articulated as pushing the boundaries of engagement further than teaching and learning discussions to partnership and co-creation in policy making, which encourages us to engage students in the purpose of why we do what we do and how we do it. So in my experience, there are three key ingredients um, for building this engagement, which include the extent to which students feel that they belong to the institution through their opportunities to make meaningful and impactful change, how much they feel valued because of this and through the actions of the institution, and how much they feel trusted as a member of the community. And this contributes to a form of what I would describe as student self-actualized engagement, where we move away from a tokenistic form of contribution to meaningful student voice, which enhances the quality work in teaching and learning provision. So it's really important that students understand why we do what we do and where they see themselves fitting, where they see a sense of connectedness with the institution, why they feel empowered to make those contributions and how valued they feel those contributions are. And then finally, how much they trust in the individuals that they're sharing those experiences with to actually deliver and action some of those ideas. And those three ingredients, I feel, really affect uh, the way in which um, engagement and student participation uh, is impacted, whether that be in a student's union or wider in a university. And so as students' unions, they have a, a large part to play in helping to support that, but we also have a large part to play in supporting wider universities and institutions to steer and navigate their practices to develop some of these key ingredients around belonging, value and trust. So if we move on to the next slide and we consider what this means in relation to participation, many of you may have seen um, Roger Hart's ladder of participation for, for young people. We're going to apply it to the context of the student body. But the en engagement that relates to students as data and simply being heard at a superficial level lends itself to this decorative or tokenized participation in which a large proportion of students and young people are often left feeling that their voices are set to the side or considered at a passive level and so in turn making the contribution they make passive. And I think lots of student officers may have felt that or experienced that um, in their time in office. I certainly did, being invited to multiple meetings and sitting down at the table and being present, being ticked off uh, and feeling like your, uh, your engagement and participation in decision making is at a very low passive level. In the same way that lots of our students, uh, particularly from underrepresented groups, were talking about how they felt they were consulted. It might be that they were part of uh, an inclusion, equality and diversity board and they were brought in on the final meeting to agree to a plan as opposed to being uh, consulted and um, supported to make decisions and provide advice and guidance at the beginning at the formulation stage. So to energise the student body and encourage participation that is meaningful and impactful, students need to be at the core of that shared decision making and action planning uh, when consulted on issues. So this model lends itself really well to reflecting on where institutions feel they are in the way of building co-creation and collaboration with students to develop better teaching and learning which is represented and centred to cater for the needs of the 21st century student body and society. And it's really important that SUs and, and wider institutions perhaps use some of these frameworks like Roger Hart's Ladder of Participation to really reflect on where they feel they are in that 
development and growth and ambition of getting to a point where uh, students are involved in that shared decision making process and what does that look like and what does that feel like to students and what impact does that have on their sense of belonging value and trust that we talked about in the previous in the previous slide around those three key ingredients to supporting students to feel like their uh, level of engagement and participation is worth investing in and is worth developing so if we move on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit now, having considered some of those contextual and theoretical frameworks, about some of my experiences as, as an officer. And hopefully they'll provide some useful insights, uh, maybe some suggestions for future practice. But really more importantly, and if anyone has, has seen me talk at other events before, um, I like to leave participants um, from these webinars with things to think about. Um, I, I think it's not always useful to provide an exhaustive list of what we think works really well and suggest that you go and implement that into your universities and your institutions. We know that uh, each student demographic and each student body is individual and it's about kind of working together to understand what type of practices and experiences are going on. So hopefully some of these um, experiences and reflections will be useful. So I'd like to identify some key themes that I've observed around poor participation and representation and then provide some examples of these. And I define these themes as over and under reliance. So where has there been an over a reliance on sabbatical officers being the voice of all? So too many times we've seen officers becoming the sole asset of student voice and these students hold positional power regardless of whether we see the role in uh, in this way or not an officer's perspective is considered as a representative sample when this may not always be the case and we've also seen for example students of color students with disabilities be in these positions who have then been asked to be the sole voice for um, aspects on equality diversity and inclusion issues and that's burdening them with the responsibility of having to retell uh, upsetting or challenging experiences for not just their community but also for other minorities as well and being packaged as a, a full equality and diversity and inclusion issue. And this can really lead to conflict and tensions when a student representative is almost uncovered as not knowing it all or not understanding each student group in the university. And SUs are seen as the tool to reach hard to reach groups where there are similarities with understanding different de de student demographics. And really what we need to think about is SUs are not doing that um, to any greater or lesser extent than, than universities, because if we were doing it better, then we'd have uncovered it and we'd have mastered the way to capture all those student voices already. So clearly there's a need for um, students' unions, uh, student student bodies to work together with their institution to find ways about working together around how to reach hard to reach groups of students. It's a, a collective and collaborative co-creative discussion and space that needs to be had as opposed to being seen as a them and us mentality. And again that them and us mentality tends to uh, lend itself to that tokenistic engagement where a university might sit back and expect the SU to provide the data and the figures and the perspectives on students and then begin to question them if they're not representative. Working together in partnership and co-creating strategies and policies around how to support and develop student engagement is one of the best ways to acknowledge that it's everybody's challenge to help support uh, engagement and participation amongst student bodies and not just those that have been elected or have put themselves forward to be representatives. So that over-reliance on student voice in the SU space results in officers feeling often quite anxious, quite stressed and frustrated as they assume the responsibility of all student voice activity on their shoulders for their term in office. In contrast to that, we have the under-reliance um, on, on representatives being viewed as invaluable, uh, not valuable uh, to understand student voice. And so student representatives often have a seat at the table, but often this is as far as the participation goes. So whilst there are lots of fantastic co-created papers or projects, some of which I've supported in my own institution, not every space welcomes the role of student voice in the same way. And often student voice can be a decorative piece to tick a box in the criteria. And some colleagues are not always equipped with the tools to be able to involve student voices effectively. So in my own institution, when I was undergraduate education officer, we worked really hard to, to, to try and ensure that the, the areas that mattered to us as a student union that we were experts on, that we were able to co-create and um, 
and cultivate with the institution. We had papers such as the Code of, of Representation going to our teaching committees, um, and there was often times where those papers would have been produced by the institution. And for a long time, that we had been able to add short paragraphs or sections to them, but never been in an, an opportunity to co-create those papers and, and co-create research and evaluation around what students were thinking and feeling. So we moved away from a, a, a model where we were just simply turning up and commenting and uh, approving papers to uh, thinking about forward planning a calendar where we were able to start having those conversations early and tap into some of the university funding pots around widening participation to use that um, that money wisely to be able to run focus groups uh, with groups of uh, individual students from different demographics, from different representative backgrounds to be able to one, find out their experiences, but also help to inform some of the work that we wanted to do around representation. And so by having that collaborative approach, we were able to draw on resources that the institution had, whilst also collectively and collaboratively understand some of these challenges and help each other to troubleshoot some of those problems and also come together to solve uh, joint issues that were a whole institutional wide issue. If we move on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of that good representation and partnership. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to talk about to begin with was uh, gaining control and re-evaluating the way in which we were talking to students about our commitments to them and their commitments to us. So we moved away from having uh, a large code of conduct to having a student partnership agreement. Now, many colleagues may already have this, um, but we chose to take this approach because we thought it uh, helped to support that, that that bedrock of belonging, value and trust uh, for students to feel like they could engage and participate in issues that mattered to them. So in my time as an officer, that one of the most effective ways of realigning that representation um, and agenda was to rework and develop some of the university student partnership agreement. And that replaced um, a large part of the student charter and helped to bring in a sense of shared accountability, commitment and equity to supporting and working with students. So in doing this, it anchored the institution and the students union to work more closely on thinking about and designing ways of reaching student groups. The SU was also part of a wider um, strategy piece of work in 2019 to support the university's five year plan at the time. And during this time, we asked senior leaders to come out and gain views from students with us, bringing the senior leaders to the spaces that students were accessing. And we believe that was a really incredibly useful method, as it meant that we uh, were seeking student views and opinions within students' own spaces, as opposed to asking them to bring their voices to a space that felt intimidating or removed in some way from, from their environment. Um, so part of the work that we did was we encouraged the vice chancellor and the senior ex uh, officer executive team to come out with us into the student union buildings and take cards that we would have been using to go and essentially flyer and leaflet students as if it was a, a general kind of um, an election time uh, in the student union. We got staff to go out and ask students directly what they thought about their teaching and learning and the university experience at UEA. And it was quite a, an interesting uh, experience watching the whole of the senior leadership team go out into the uh, into the student union building and suddenly realise the enormity of how to access these student voices. And that sometimes that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And there's nuance and complexity to that. Um, but getting our our executive team to go out into the spaces that we were trying to access students and going up to them and asking them questions in, in a way that felt um, accessible to, to those student groups, we found to be a really fruitful exercise and felt that actually that was a, a major part of building the, uh, the student partnership agreement because it helped to identify some of these key thematic priorities that were coming out of the strategy, but also out of some of the conversations that we were both the executive team and officer team having with the student body on the ground in their spaces. And there's something to be said for that really, isn't there, I think about, and I've always been a huge advocate for going to the students in their spaces whether that be uh, going along to society events or club events, I mean, whether it be going along to um, particular uh, 
hard to reach groups. Uh, in, for example, for us at, at UEA, it was about uh, healthcare students and the problems that they had with uh, accessing extracurricular activities in the timetable, going over to those really hard to reach campus um, sites, taking the walk with them, uh, meeting them at a central point and heading over to, to their lecture that they had to get to in 10 minutes when it was a 20 minute walk, having those conversations with them, living those experiences with them side by side and encouraging our executive team at the university to do that with us helped us to, um, to identify these thematic priorities. So what we did with this student partnership agreement was be really clear about how the SU and the university are committed to providing opportunities to uh, improve these different areas so whether it be inclusion for example being committed to ensuring a vibrant accessible and safe community where there's equitable opportunity and swift response to concerns raised around discrimination we decided to commit ourselves as a joint collaborative enterprise to these different uh, thematic priorities. And then we were able to communicate that to students in our own campaign work. Uh, and we felt that this helped to give real clarity to students, not on what we were expecting them to do in terms of coming to us with issues and asking them to come and relay their experiences, but what our commitment was to them, not just as an SU in conflict with the university, but as a collective, as a, as a full institution, what we were going to do and what we think we want to deliver around these priorities for students. And running all the way through that, again, is that, that word for key ingredient that we had with key ingredients, that transparent and trusted relationship. And we felt being clear about what we think is uh, important to students and how we're committed to doing that would help to build some of that trusted and transparent relationship. And we took a similar approach with that trust and transparent relationship to harnessing the voices of students from commuter and mature backgrounds. So we're taking the time to ride on the park and ride with them, attend breakfast in the early hours as they arrive to start a long day, uh, uh, making the most of um, you know, missing the traffic to get to a lecture for 9am. We found a lot of students were coming in and were here from 7am because if they were uh, leaving at eight o'clock, they wouldn't be able to get uh, you know, from Kings Lynn to Norwich and then from the park and ride to the UEA. So we took the time to identify some of the challenges and made sure that we were present in some of those student experiences to A, experience the challenges uh, to some degree that those students were having, but also to communicate with the students and understand what they were experiencing and why they wanted something to change and how that was affecting their engagement in, in their actual experiences, in their environments. And we found that particularly fruitful, particularly when we were then writing things like the access and participation plan, student submission, all of that information, the wealth of research and experience that we'd had with those students made us feel like we were advocating and representing students to a much greater level. And again, they were sometimes small proportions of students, but we felt that the extent and the depth that we'd be able to get about the richness of their experiences meant that we were able to advocate and represent them better when it came to talking at, at national and local level in the institution. So these interventions really allowed us to gain insights into experiences that were useful to support written reports and um, for the access and participation plans. Uh, but still, we receive little engagement from these groups sometimes. So relying on the same voices and experiences. And one way we tried to drive a change was to uh, use our existing vocal students to form panels of experts and work with us on thinking of new ways to access these groups of students that were hard to reach. So we identified that we had a really, uh, a really good set of, uh, of student leaders from across a range of different backgrounds. We had students with disabilities, students of colour, mature students, um, students with English as an additional language. We had students with um, visible and invisible disabilities, uh, but we had the same students representing us. And again, if we go back to what we were talking about before around that tokenistic engagement or that over-reliance on some voices, what we decided to do was completely remove them from our population sample and give them a representative advisory role. Because what we realised was when we were starting to develop surveys or go and do focus groups, we then had a core group of students that we could go to and say, we're thinking of creating this vehicle to try and understand and engage our students. Do you think that's going to work? And students often came back and said, you've completely forgotten about the fact that you're excluding that set of students that if you do it at this time, you're going to 
half your population sample, you do realise that students have been inundated with emails like this. Have you considered the language about what you're using? Are you talking about those students in a deficit way, that they're lacking something rather than valuing their experiences? And so we really learned a lot from those students that we were over relying on for uh, data. And by pulling them out and presenting them as experts, they were able to help influence and shape the work that we then did to try and reach hard to reach groups. Still not something that we managed to achieve in the two years, still something that is ever evolving. But I think trying to frame um, some of your students that you know you uh, rely on too much and place them in an expert role removes them from that population and then allows you to use them as aids to help think about how to better reach those hard to reach groups because they will have experiences of when they were hard to reach and they will hopefully want to share those experiences to better um, your ability to reach those students so they don't have those same experiences that maybe they had when they started at university. And so I think one of the the key things in that and in places these exercises were really fruitful but it was nothing more than just to understand some of the barriers that groups were facing and that we may not have considered when designing the feedback and the research methods for engaging those students so again not always uh, you know broadening our representative sample by tens or hundreds of students but actually beginning to understand and break down some of those barriers that have been put up culturally, socially, uh, through power structures at the university, really getting under the skin of those barriers first to understand how we might start to tackle them as an institution to then hopefully uh, impact on the level of engagement that we would have. So we found that uh, the, the, the student partnership agreement opened up lots of those conversations and allowed us to start having that transparent and trusted relationship with, with some of the students and reshape how we thought about engagement or um, planning engagement with students in the future. So moving on to the next slide, you've heard me talk for, uh, for quite a while. I think the plan for us now is to have um, some breakout groups. And I want to go back to some of those questions that we had uh, on uh, Hearts Ladder of Participation. You can see them here. Uh, I'd like us to really consider the ways in which forms of student engagement are aligned to the concept of a ladder of participation. And so where does your student engagement in teaching and learning sit on this ladder at the moment from your experiences? What are the characteristics that make that so? Can you give examples of why you would put your level of student engagement at a tokenistic or a co-creative level? And then how can you apply the principles of that self-actualized engagement and meaningful participation to your current practices to better their value? Sometimes it's just about amending and adjusting what we do to make it more meaningful. So are there examples of ways that you try to engage students or maybe you've got an engagement strategy or a student partnership agreement? What could you do considering some of these ideas around the ladder of participation and the self-actualized engagement to tweak those to make them more effective and maximize their impact and value? And then we'll have a look at some of the, the, the responses on the Padlet. And I think we're going to be jumping into the breakout rooms to have a discussion with you. So I'll hand back over to, to you, Ashley, for now. So, Callum, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you ever so much, everyone, for engaging with those conversations. It's been a lively uh, sort of lunchtime conversation, I think, today. Um, uh, really nice to hear about some of the uh, the change and transformation that's happening in some of the institutions. So in the first group, we were talking about, you know, how to really capitalise on perhaps some of these discussions with students around um, participation and engagement as uh, an institution is going through change. So if you're in an institution that's about to go through a review, whether it be through staff restructures or it be through represent representation restructures, a great thing to do would be to take some of these principles back and work with your representatives and with your student body on where do they feel they sit within uh, this sort of ladder of participation. So we were talking in the second group about um, representatives uh, and course reps in different spaces um, and about really feeling valued and heard. To what extent um, are the are our students' voices um, actually taken up in a dialogue. So instead of thinking about feeding back, thinking about feeding forward, to what extent do uh, the conversations that happen in maybe course representation meetings uh, feel like there is a, a an issue and a solution? And sometimes those solutions are not always um, achievable if we've got particular big issues surrounding curriculum, uh, whether it be like decolonization or belonging or um, inclusion, equality and diversity. They're not things that are going 
going to be solved by just the faculty going back and asking a question and saying yes or no. And so actually trying to frame and support course representatives and schools uh, in your universities to think about how to frame their dialogues and discussions around feeding forward might be a great way to open up some of that dialogue and produce more uh, opportunities for uh, equality and more student driven um, ideas and rhetoric. Um, there's lots of talk in the in the Padlet I can see about sort of incentives and uh, trying to encourage the students at the beginning of the year to feel like they're part of a community and there's something really important in that isn't there around uh, a sense of belonging and we talked about belonging being one of those three kind of key ingredients for um, this participation and contributing to that self-actualized learning we were talking in in um in group two about what does self-actualized engagement mean and talking about some of the characteristics of that and feeling that you're valued and feeling that there's a, a sense of equity and developing an identity as an expert in your experiences and uh, actually one of the best ways to do that is to go and see those students in those in those spaces and whilst they're having those experiences and ten, taking the time to build that value and that trust with them so that they feel like their their experiences in their own rawest form are really important and help are helping to inform decisions about university um, and teaching and learning and wider uh, experience practice so some great conversations Ashley. i don't know if you had anything different uh, we had a lot of very similar stuff. I think the only thing I would add to that was specifically around the incentivization piece, because that's kind of when we switched mm. when you were in the first group. And we kind of diverted to, to some conversations around how um, incentives are, 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 are overused and why is that? Mm. Um, and I think one of the key kind of aspects that um, we, we talked about was how actually student life is very different. Uh, than it was say five 10 15 years ago where mm. students unions were built on volunteer labor the ability for students to do as much volunteer labor as they used to either based on cost of living or covid um or from the other side of the commercialization of higher education which means students feel like they mm. have to put more time in their degree than the kind of holistic student experience makes it even more difficult to get students to yeah. see anything outside their degree um which is really sad because the whole point of of higher education uh, and learning more generally is to have that holistic learning experience. It's not just about your lectures and seminars. Um, yeah. So I think there is there's a real key aspect there of how we make sure we don't lose that um, in the sector. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that you just reminded me of, which I was sort of reflecting on now in my officer experience, one of the things that I really regret is um, we had a, a you know, a battle around hoodies for course representatives. You know, when I first came into office, I was so adamant that, uh, you know, providing every student with a hoodie that was a course representative and they would wear, wear them around campus and it would give them a greater sense of identity and belonging and it would even help with the NSS score. I was determined to prove that to the university to get that funding. Actually reflecting on it now, I wish I'd started earlier with that student partnership piece and that collaborative um, sense of student engagement piece. I wish I'd started with that more and I'd started to empower our student body to be um, experts in their field and consult with them earlier. Um, you know, the, I had the beauty of two years, so I did more of that in the second year, but we had COVID as a barrier. Um, and so if I was doing my time again, I think I'd spend less time on worrying about if every student had a hoodie or a keep cup yeah. and thinking about that bedrock of student engagement and what's ingrained in our institutional practices, how we're working with the university, what's our language like with students, what is the impact of how we're doing things at the moment on, the, on students' sense of equity and participation and how can we learn from them to change that and, and to make meaningful change, which gives them more meaning and more... Um, more ownership on their on their own learning and and social experiences at university yeah 100 uh, percent. so that is the end of our webinar thank you very much Cal callum for coming along i think we've had some really interesting and different conversations which is the whole reason of these 